A Stowaway by Alvin Henner. She stole away to the moon in search of glory, but found a far different destiny. His eyes were a little feverish, as they had been of late. His voice held a continuous intensity, as though he were imparting a secret. I got to get out on that ship. I got to, I tell you, I'm going to make it. Different members of the group regarded him variously. Some with amusement, some with contempt, others with frank curiosity. You're just oh, plain nuts, Joe. What do you want to go to the moon for? Sure, what do you want to go? What you got? What you got on the moon we haven't got right here? There was, there was general laughter from the dozen or so who at, sat eating their lunch shade of building B. They all thought that there was a pretty good one. Good enough to repeat. Sure, what you got on the moon? We have got here. But Joe Spain wasn't in a mood for jokes. He burned with even greater conviction and stood up as though to hanorage the workers. You want to know why I got to go to the moon? Why I got to get on that ship? And I'll tell you, it's because I'm a little guy. That's why. Joe Spain, working stiff, one of the great inarticulate masses. More laughter. Where you get those big words, Joey? I have a book. Come on, talk English. Joe Spain pointed to the huge tube-like building, A, off across the desert, a building you had to have two different passes and a written permit to enter. Mystery building where... Even the newspaper reporters were barred. It's only the big shots they let in, isn't it? There, there, here, yeah, isn't it? Only them. I got dragged or went to college or something. Us little guys, they tell you to blow, blow to blow. Isn't that right? Who the hell cares? Maybe it's a damn good place to stay away from. Maybe it's explored or something. Explode or something. Who wants to die and collect his insurance? I've got to get on that ship. It blasts off because they can't push the masses around. We've got the right to be represented, even if we've got to sneak in. Me? I'll stay on the ground. And besides, there's a glory, you guys. You're too stupid to see. But that's, but it's there. A glory being on the first rocket ship to the moon. The name of James Bade, Bane, written down in the history books and said over by people and school kids for thousands of years and with the um, mortality, that's the word. Well, you can just forget about it, Joe, because you ain't going, ain't going. Joe and Spain's eyes burned altogether. Joe and Spain coming down the ramp with the big shots was all over, news cameras snapping, people asking for interviews. You ain't going, cos... Joe shouted a man down. Then the other thing, us little people entitled to representative aboard of that ship. We've got a right to know what's going on. How come there's nothing about it in the papers? Only the big shots knowing about it and whispering among themselves. It's because they're trying to snag it all and freeze us all out. Us out. You're crazy. It's for security reasons. It's all hush-hush. It won't leak out like the atom bomb did. The big boys are being smart this time. Are you ain't getting on? The interrupted man repeated doggedly. Because there ain't no way in God's world to get on. With, with triple security all around the building. Just tell me a way to get in. Just tell me one. I'm going to get on that ship, Joe Spain said. Then he clammed up suddenly. Joe Spain wasn't stupid. He was a talker, but he knew when to stop standing off. The men went back to the work, shifting the big aluminium barrels from trucks into building A, B, in, back from trucks into building B, carrying the wooden crates and paper wrapped parcels by the ramp, up the ramps, up and to the side of the building facing the big secret structure labelled A. They worked until five o'clock. They fouled out and got into the waiting trucks and were hauled down to the town. A boom town that had mushroomed up the desert overnight and would die with the same swiftness when the project was completed.
Joe went straight to his rooming house, washed up, put his put on, put on his good shoes, and found a stall in a nearby restaurant. He ate a legendary supper, glancing now and again at the clock. When the clock read eight, he went out to the neon stained darkness and walked three blocks to the Black Cat and the three night clubs that the desert town boasted. He went to the bar and ordered a drink. He downed it slowly, carefully, after the manner of a man who wanted to stay sober. Half an hour passed before a thin, nervous individual elbowed to the bar and stood beside Joe and him. Joe said, Hello, Nick. You been thinking it over? I need a drink. Sure, Nick. Then we go someplace and talk. But Nick got rid of five drinks while Joe protected his own glass with the bar from the guard keep. After a while, Joe said, I'm willing to, to up the price, Nick. Two thousand cash are all I've got. He's not. It's cut out of here. Nick mumbled. He walked out of the town into the desert, Nick stumbling now and again to be supported by the tense, sober Joe. Two thousand, Nick. You need the dough. Sure, need the dough, but it won't work. Could you get into could you get into one of them barrels? You yeah, you would have you wouldn't have to. Why else is it you come along in the morning and seal me up in one? All you have to do is lock is to it's lock on the lid. How oh, you and all the barrels are going on the ship. Never mind about that. I just know. I pay to find out. Okay. Suppose you get on the ship in barrel. Maybe it's be stored in hold somewhere. Maybe they won't open it. Very soon you die. I got a way out got a way to get out. One of the special torches. The little ones. I didn't mean when it's that strong. I can cut it like butter. It'd be hot. You'll burn yourself. Don't let me worry about that, Joe said fiercely. You got the two grand? You want the two grand or not? Nick wanted the two thousand. He was, always, he was against the wall for the excuses. Then he had a happy fault. Barrels is I are tight. You some other things. Mm, impractical. You thought we forget it. I won't some other. I'm taking my own oxygen, enough to let me clear to the moon. If it has, if it has to, come on, break down. Okay, two grand. Go, got to have dough now, though. He starts singing. Joe Spain counted out two thousand cash. We finish. He had exactly nine dollars left. He was a pauper, but the happiest pauper who ever brought with his whole fortune a thing he most thing he craved most. You won't double cross me now, will you? If you if you got got any ideas like that, I'd like I'd do like we said. Nick Sparks never went back on his word never went back on his word, never. But now you're going to stay hid. It's time to leave work. Leave that to me. I'll be easy. Be easy. They won't don't check. Building B too close. No double check, because it's over a mile from building A, outside some safety perimeter. I'll stay in tomorrow night. I'll put a little chalk mark on the barrel. I'm in. Right near the top rim. First thing you do when you come to work, it will only seal it and line it up with the field ones. Okay, but i got to go home. Now i got to go got ahead. i got to get some sleep. What's in the duffel bag? What's in the duffel bag? Clean overalls. Towel. Joe pulled the zipper down halfway. Guard fingered the blue demon, but didn't dig deeper to find the towel. He checked Joe's badge number, made a note with his pad, motioned to the next worker. Joe let tight breath slowly out of his lungs. He walked towards building B. Getting past the guard was a load off his mind. He expected to get by, but was one of the, that. But it was one of the calculated risks that should could have stopped him cold. Once outside inside the building, he went to put the bag into his locker and went to work. He laboured briskly and carried more than his share of the load. But now and again, he stopped to look up over the, out at the outline of the building A. 
loomed hard in its hot blazing sky, and each time it was the sense of heady exhilaration that he thought of his destiny, his hard earned, dearly brought destiny. He was a, it'd be among the selected group that first set upon the surface of the moon. He had no worries about not being allowed to do so. Once he showed himself with a ship far out in space, they have to accept him. Not graciously, of course. They have to admire his courage and tenacity. They could not, he could not, in all humanity, deny him his share of the victory. The day wore on, and as on, on, as a critting time approached, he became more tense, more alert. Five minutes before the whistle, he fainted back in the building, hurried to the laboratory. He went into the booth, furthest from the entrance, and locked the door. There was nothing to do but wait. Another calculated risk. The whistle blew. Almost immediately, the sound of footsteps broke the silence, and the laboratory was filled with hurrying men. He stayed in the room with short. However, as Joe had known it would be, Men leaving for home do not dwindle on the premises. The laboratory was empty again. A period of silence. Well, Joe raised his feet from the floor and braced them on the toilet seat. The entrance door opened, a guard making the departure check-up. Joe held his breath. As the guard came down on the line and tried the door, he was finished. But Joe had blanked upon Human nature, the guard stopped for a long moment. There was no sound, and Joe knew the man was bending over to run his eyes down the line of toilets close to the floor. In this manner, he could see the floor of every booth. The guard straightened, turned, walked out. The door closed, silence. Joe's heart swelled with gratitude. He grinned, looking round forward with joy to the long night ahead. He found a spot over behind the barrels, where the night watchman would have to climb over a lot of equipment in order to find him. He made himself comfortable, practically certain. The guard would not do this. He stretched out the hard floor and watched the passing of the hours by a number of times the watchman went through. He surprised at how fast the time passed, finally checking his count carefully. He left his hiding place and tiptoed to the line of the lockers. He took the oxygen equipment from the duffel bag after, which he, he had hidden in the bag and clothing within, behind a wall flange in the far corner. Then he climbed into a barrel on the first end of the packing line. He checked the barrel with a small axe and took it, the lid into place. Pine passed, nothing happened. He wondered if he missed on it. On the time element, man could should certainly have come to work now. More than once he attempted to push the barrel at left side, check the situation. The footsteps sounded close by, a lid snapped firmly into place. He was glad he hadn't done so. Good old Nick. When he got back when he got back from the moon, he was seated and Nick got credit for his courageous act. Soon the barrel began to move. Joe felt it raise in the air and settle with a bump. And the motor truck roared, and Joe knew where he was going. Straight forward, building A, the moon rocket. There was more movement until finally the barrel was set down for what appeared to be the last time. Joe put the nose piece of the oxygen tube into place, visualized himself safe and snug in the storage room of the rocket, closed his eyes, and went peacefully to sleep. He spent a long time to be awoken by a crushing, a wrenching. That all but all but drove his head down into the spine. The pain brought him sharply alert. He knew instantly what that happened. Blast off! He braced himself against the sides of the barrel, gritted his teeth. Soon it was, it was better. There was no pressure at all. Only the fierce happiness of his heart. He set a course and won through. He was on his way to the moon. Joe let plenty of time elapse. He knew it was all well over an hour later when he unlimbered a torch to cut an escape hole in the barrel. This, he knew, would be tricky. He could easily burn himself. The heat would be intense. That wasn't too bad. The aluminium cut quickly. In a matter of minutes, he was standing beside his barrel. As expected, it was a storage hold. The darkness did not bother him. He came compared with a small pencil flash 
The through on the aqua beam had got beam. He pulled on the door, opened it, and went out to a long passageway. Now he covered the late breadth of the ship. He found a lot of rooms. It all pitch blackness, no observation ports, and no living things. He found he stood frozen out in one of the rooms while the beam of his flesh picked up a code stenciled in a steel plate over some piece of machinery. X five nine dash V O six M Y Experimental Explosion Rocket Moon A flash dropped from Joe Spain's fingers. He stood at pit, in a pitch blackness with the jets vibrated from the room of the rocket. There's no fear in him, only great pain of fertility, only his tears, and his whispered words. They'll never know. Nobody won't ever know.